Good afternoon, everyone. Looks like the sun is coming out. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson. Delighted to have have you with us this afternoon. And and hello also to. You can't hear me. Uh, is it on now? Okay. Can you hear me now? No. Testing. Can you hear me? Maybe, maybe closer to your mouth. Can you hear me now? All, all good now? All right, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. We do a mic test. And uh, one reason that microphones are important, I think most of you already know, is that we do, we do tape and video these and have uh, very large audiences for a long time thereafter. And I think this is going to be a panel of considerable interest. Uh, banning books. Um, you know, I think the ideas team, if they had gotten together three or four years ago and discussed web topics in the future years, I don't think anyone would have imagined that it would have been conceivable that we would be having a panel talking about banning books. Uh, but given so many other things we see around us and how our society is riven in so many ways, it's perhaps not surprising that this, in fact, is an incredibly timely topic. And it fits into the trust track of the festival in, I think, very important ways as well. Uh, whom do we or should we trust uh, to tell us what we read or what our neighbors might read or what our children might read or probably much more accurately what they can't read uh, or what we can't read. Um, banning books, uh, our panelists, and I'll introduce them in a second, probably know much more about this and its history than I do, but uh, it, banning books is probably something that began shortly after Gutenberg and his printing press, and certainly the, the idea about the importance of suppressing ideas that those in power and influence don't like is probably as old as ideas are themselves. Uh, but we, we now are facing them in contexts that we haven't for some time, I think, in the United States. Um, I actually am an imposter today. I am stepping in for a moderator. Uh, I'm very sorry I couldn't come. I think that uh, he is among, I don't, I don't see the latest number, 14 or 20 uh, speakers who could not come because they came down with COVID in just the last few days, so I don't need to tell anybody in this room. It's certainly not over. Uh, but Kiese Lehman uh, was going to be here, a very distinguished novelist, essayist, and memoirist, and uh, I, I'm very sorry that he wasn't able to do it. Uh, our guests are ideal for this topic. Um, the chief executive of the nation's largest uh, public library system, and the former and longtime national president of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, Nadine Strassen is, is now uh, a professor emeritus at the NYU Law School, is one of uh, our luminaries in constitutional law and civil liberties, uh, um, and serves on many boards dealing with critical issues relating to uh, the First Amendment and author of a number of must-read books addressing such issues as free speech, censorship, hate speech, pornography, women's rights, and the list goes on. And John Sabo oversees the Los Angeles Public Library, serving more people than any public library in the United States with 72 branches. He's also led many critical initiatives in Los Angeles dealing with issues such as immigrant integration, uh, improving uh, uh, um, financial literacy, which of course is an enormously important issue, and providing health resources uh, to people who otherwise wouldn't know where to get them. And he's also quite active on library-related issues globally, so perhaps we, or when I turn it to you, will get a chance to ask questions about how the issues about banning books in other countries uh, relate to the ones we face ourselves. So let me, let me start uh, with a question that I know uh, KSA was going to ask, uh, which is, um, did either of you have any experiences in your own early formative years about books that someone said you couldn't read? And if so, how did that change your attitudes toward the general question? Nadine? 
I was an early victim of book banning, and the silver lining to that cloud is it probably fueled my lifelong activism against censorship, including uh, specifically when kids are targeted for censorship. I grew up in Hopkins, Minnesota, a suburb of Minneapolis. My parents were very, oh, <laughs> my parents were very devoted to, so you know it's the raspberry capital of the world. Um, my parents were very devoted to education and reading, but they were not uh, financially well off, so we, and they were also supporters of the library. They didn't really buy many books. I was dependent on the public library system. And in Hopkins at that time, in the entire library, there were only two rooms of books that were available to anybody who was under the age of 17. And in fairness, this was before the American Library Association adopted in uh, 1967 the Library Bill of Rights, which said that nobody could be discriminated against in terms of access to books and other resources, including on the basis of age, but that came along a little bit too late. So I had read my way through those two rooms many, many times over, long before I reached the age of 17. And to add insult to injury, uh, among my favorite books had been the Nancy Drew mystery series, and at one point, they entirely disappeared. I, I've done research, and that was a common phenomenon. Uh, the reason why those books were attacked apparently was because she defied gender stereotypes at the time as an adventurous and enterprising and independent young woman. This was seen as too dangerous for people under the age of 17. John, anything in your experience? Well, I did most of my growing up in Montgomery, Alabama. And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, and I was an only child. Uh, my mother passed away when I was 10, raised by my dad, who was uh, an Air Force officer. And he often would drop me off at the community library on the Air Force base there, uh, where I just thought it was fantastic to be able to explore all that was there and on the shelves. And not a book banning experience, but a, an important early experience in what goes on shelves uh, and what might not be on library shelves. I remember as a uh, probably an 11, 12 year old discovering a book about being gay on the shelf of a military library in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, and another novel with a gay character in it. And the fact that those books were on those shelves on a military base in Montgomery, Alabama, and what that communicated to an 11-year-old mm -hmm. about the institution of a library, about who worked there. Uh, someone had to make that decision, maybe a courageous decision to do that. And it, it, it said something early to me about sort of the, the principles, of, and it was because there was a librarian that had a commitment to the Library Bill of Rights and all to put those books on the shelf. So that's a, a powerful, memory to me. And then uh, as I began working in libraries as a clerk, uh, some, some really good experiences around book banning where books were not taken out of the collection, but also things like, I remember Madonna's sex book. Uh, and uh, that was a real issue for libraries. And a lot of libraries certainly added it. They hid it away in places. Other libraries used the fact that it was spiral bound to say that it's just not suitable for circulation in a library collection, or it had an aluminum cover or something like that. Uh, and then uh, Salman Rushdie's um, Satanic Versus was, um, was something that I remember when I was a clerk in a public library in the South, the circulation manager's solution was to wrap it in brown paper and tuck it away in a filing cabinet uh, hope, until the sort of controversy passed. Uh, all important early lessons um, to me. But I've directed five libraries in my career now, LA. I've never banned a book. I've had several challenges, a small town of 8,000 people in southern Illinois all the way to LA, uh, and I'm, I'm real proud that we've well, never removed a book. Yeah. Let's, just stay, let's just stay on, on that uh, for a minute. I, I think we're all aware from just what we read and hear, and I have a daughter who's on a school board, about the challenges in schools today. And, and, and all of the efforts uh, to either remove certain books, and, and from my understanding, this is not, this is the right and the left. These, these are issues ac across the ideological spectrum. 
and then the issues, of course, about, about what should be taught in schools, which we'll also talk about, slightly separate issue. It's ideas and not necessarily particular books about, for example, critical race theory, which most people who talk about it don't know what it is, but you know, whether children should be exposed at delicate ages to facts about our history of, of slavery and, and segregation and the like. But what about libraries? I, I think most of us don't read as much about this. Is this, is this a growing issue in, in libraries? And, 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 and just it tell is. us about that. It is, uh, and it's an alarming issue in libraries. Uh, you mentioned you never thought we'd have a panel in 2022 talking about banning books. And, in my career, it sort of seems like something from the 80s. I remember yeah. it from my early days in libraries. Uh, but, but the American Library Association, which tracks challenges, book challenges and books that are banned, uh, each year uh, it has reached McCarthy-era levels uh, in, the, in the most recent year. Uh, there are coordinated efforts by individuals and organizations across the country to challenge materials in small libraries and suburban libraries and big city libraries as well. So it is a, a very, very alarming issue that I think has you know, broader, broader implications. And librarians are interested in having collections that represent the communities they serve. And one of the challenges, and I think it's a really important point to make when you talk about book banning, is that the 100 plus years of publishing that, that we've had, frankly, have not produced material that reflects the communities we serve. And so now you're seeing books that uh, about uh, the black experience by black authors, these are books that are frequently challenged, uh, being published more and more, and books, LGBTQ issues being published more and more. And so librarians are seeking not to indoctrinate communities or push a particular point of view, but seeking to have more representative collections. And that, that goes for programming and other things that we do in libraries. But it has very serious implications, I think, for libraries generally as an institution, and that if, concerns me. If I can add to um, John's excellent remarks, in addition to the American Library Association annual reports, uh, PEN America, which is an organization that consists of, it's at the intersection of writing and censorship. They just did a report that came out in March or April and also showed um, what was described as an alarming rate of book banning in libraries and schools. And these issues are integrally interrelated. Elliot, um, but what's of even more concern is that both of these organizations have warned that high as the numbers of reported banning incidents are, they are probably only the tip of, of the, the iceberg. iceberg, that it's probably a large percentage Absolutely. that isn't even being reported. Well, Nadine, you actually, you both mentioned, and you as an expert in the, in, the, in the Bill of Rights talk about a library Bill of Rights, which I never knew existed. Just tell us a little bit about that. I, I presume it's based on traditional sort of classic liberal principles of, of freedom of expression and regardless of ideology. So tell us about that. Exactly. And it was adopted in 1967, um, arising out of concerns about uh, one of the earlier periods of censorship during McCarthyism and uh, the Red Scare. By the way, uh, Pan America uses the term Ed Scare now to describe what's uh, going on, the fear of ideas in public schools and public libraries. And the Library Bill of Rights really reflects over and over again the concept of viewpoint neutrality, which the Supreme Court has described as the bedrock principle underlying freedom of speech in general. And that is that the library, of course, has to make decisions in terms of the quality of the content, the importance of it, of uh, particular materials. It should be reflective of every member of the community, every group in the community, uh, regardless of who they are, regardless of what they believe, and that, but never, should a book be excluded because of disagreement with or disapproval of the ideas or because of disapproval of the author. And we have recently seen attacks, including from the left, on having books by or about certain individuals who have been accused of 
various heinous crimes, including sexual offenses. According to the Library Bill of Rights, that is an irrelevant consideration in determining whether the book should be included. As I already mentioned, uh, it is a non-discriminatory policy also in terms of access. Regardless of who you are, no matter how young you are, you still have access. And, and it applies uh, not only to books, but to every other resource, including, importantly, uh, meeting rooms and, and, and access to bulletin boards. And this has also been a source of controversy lately, including uh, from the left when cer certain organizations that have controversial viewpoints with respect to gender identity and trans issues have been uh, sought to be excluded from public libraries on the ground that um, they will endanger the safety of other patrons or library staff members. And these are very important controversies that are parallel to controversies we find on college campuses mm -hmm. about having controversial speakers. And, and we may come back to some of the differences we see between you know, libraries, say, in universities, libraries in high schools, libraries in elementary schools, and, and there are certain age considerations. But, but John, can you give us any examples from either your experience or other librarians' experiences recently for us to understand you know, some concrete examples of, of the, these challenges? Sure, and I, you know, in Texas, I know I've had a few conversations about the Texas librarian who was fired for refusing She's a branch manager in Texas refusing to remove books that were on a very specific list that had been given to the library saying you are not to have these books on the shelf, remove them. And furthermore, the library will cease acquiring books for the time being, who knows when that'll start again. Uh, but that person you know, st stuck to her principles and has lost her job. And you know, I, I think that the, one of the concerns I have is that this you know, it's not just about this small town or this, you know, area. And it's not, this is not just in one geography in the country. Um, and it's not just about single book titles. Um, it is, I'm, I'm worried that an institution that has been so trusted for decades, and that is something that we in libraries, I mean, I just treasure, you know, I think that is, we're trusted in a way that so many institutions aren't. And I've worked for all, you know, elected officials of all uh, political persuasions, all Republican city council, all Democratic county commission. And um, by and large, everyone loves libraries, gets libraries, and understands that mission of libraries. And I worry that this issue is going to, you know, become so pervasive in the, in the public discussion that libraries will become a, 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 the bad guy and that it will affect library funding and that it, uh, it will draw in other issues uh, and affect our ability to effectively serve everyone because that is exactly what we do every morning. We open our doors like this and we serve absolutely everybody. We serve the unhoused, the undocumented, the documented, the wealthy and the poor. Um, the illiterate. The illiterate uh, and we're really important to our democracy. And this panel discussion, by the way, could not be in a better track than one called trust in my opinion. <laughs> I spoke at the Texas Library Association <laughs> annual convention in April, and I met mm. that courageous librarian. Mm -hmm. um, what happened there is, uh, I, I think, emblematic of what is beginning to happen elsewhere. So I'd like to provide a bit more detail, which is one member of the Texas legislature uh, had a list of 850 books uh, and it seems that this was a list that was compiled perversely from looking at curricula and other recommendations about DEI issues. So he turned books that had been recommended for increasing people's understanding and awareness of minority communities that traditionally had been relatively voiceless and disempowered and turned that into a blacklist, sent that to every single public library and school library in the state 
uh, with a demand that they report whether they had it, how much money they spent on it, and you better believe a number of the districts, not surprisingly, and libraries responded by immediately getting rid of the books because they were afraid that this was going to put uh, a, a target on their back. And um, so that's the kind of resource, if you will, that can be distributed and replicated around the country. And if you don't want the content, and you don't want to read it, and you don't want your children to read it, by all means, we support your decision to not, not read it, but don't make a decision that says no one in the community can, can have access to that. Also, the classics are still being challenged. To Kill a Mockingbird, regularly on the uh, uh, most challenged book list. Uh, the Bluest Eyes uh, by Toni Morrison, beloved by Toni Morrison, regularly challenged. Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, uh, regularly challenged uh, in libraries. So uh, one of the things that always amazes librarians is the things that people choose to challenge. Are, we're all like, well, there's some much more <laughs> crazier stuff in the collection than the thing you're challenging. Um, and also books that get challenged Interestingly, uh, well, how much often can go to the top of the best the seller list. Yeah. They, they, the sales go through the roof, so there is some saving grace for the author. I'm least. just sort of wondering how many of those books that are being challenged by those people have actually been read by those people. Challenged. So, if I may, uh, public libraries uh, uh, many, 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 many years ago developed processes, you know, in each library to challenge materials instead of just saying take it off the shelf. We have a, a very formal process, a form to fill out, and that form specifically asks that question, have you read the entire work or viewed the entire work? What's specifically about it with page numbers? Be as specific as you can about, and um, frequently th they've not read the entire work, and frequently it's just a, it's a general objection to it. So, May I comment on, yeah, on one really important point that John made? He, he referred to uh, a couple books that regularly are challenged from the left, um, To Kill a Mockingbird and Huckleberry Finn, and another one on that list is Of Mice and Men, mm -hmm. uh, because of racist language and because of uh, alleged white savior complexes. And I think to, for libraries to continue to deserve the trust that they still have, according to the latest polls, mm -hmm. um, uh, and that is essential for them to continue to serve this role for individuals and for our democracy. Librarians have to be scrupulously neutral in resisting progressive sounding rationales for removing books, as well as anti progressive rationales for removing books. Agreed. So Nadine, given the limitations of the law, constitutional, statutory, to deal with issues like this, talk to us a little bit about the, um, you know, what, what would you say, sort of the, the, the free speech or speech protective culture in our country that allows these issues to percolate or, or the opposite of that and the presence of so-called, uh, whether it's cancel culture or self-censorship, what about the culture that creates these controversies that come to John's doorstep? Well, starting with, with the law, because I think it's important to know that there is some protection in the First Amendment, uh, but it's not as strong as many of us would like it to be. The United States Supreme Court has decided only one case on point. It's an old case, goes back to 1982, it was litigated by the New York Civil Liberties Union, branch of local branch of the ACLU, and it was, John referred earlier to the 80s probably being the last period when we had really strong wave of censorship, quite similar to what we have now. There were then mostly conservative organizations, including the Moral Majority, uh, that had a list of books that they said, and I will never forget the language, which is quoted in the Supreme Court opinion, books that were anti-Semitic, anti-Christian, anti-American, and just plain filthy. And they included, you know, the, some of the perennial favorites that, that John has, has uh, referred to. Uh, the Supreme Court issued a plurality opinion, which means that it didn't have a majority vote, but four justices subscribed to a really important principle, which is recognizing that 
libraries had, and, and by the way, this had to do only with removals of books. There, no discussion at all of the discretion that goes into acquiring books in the first place, which is even more sensitive. Uh, but they said, we recognize that books could be removed for a legitimate reason. For example, if they're not educationally suitable or if they're pervasively vulgar. But it is never legitimate to remove books solely because of disagreement with their ideas or because of discrimination against the authors. And I wish we had more than four votes, but that's the most solid principle we have legally. Now, that does not apply to the school library context. Uh, it, it, or, I'm sorry, it doesn't apply to the curricular context. Uh, so that's a different uh, situation legally. And it also does not apply to any private institutions which are not bound by the First Amendment, including private schools, uh, and for that matter, private universities. So uh, for all of those reasons, as well as for the fact that law is necessary but not sufficient to give us robust freedom of speech and reality, we really need to complement the law with a robust free speech culture so that uh, parents and other concerned members of the community understand what an important stake they have, no matter what their own ideas and values are with respect to their own children, uh, that they have to respect those same rights and perhaps different values with respect to other people's children because ultimately that's gonna determine who is elected to school boards, who's elected to library boards, who's elected to legislatures. Dare I say, who's appointed to the Supreme Court? This all traces back uh, to wielding political power, which comes uh, to community values. We'll, we'll come back before I turn it to the audience to things that we all can do about this in our own communities. But just, just one, one additional question, John, about, uh, about, about libraries. Libraries do lots of things uh, other than put books on shelves. And in my community, I'm sure many, of, many people here, uh, they're exhibits, they're programs, they're, they're, they're really, places where, where people come together to learn and, and talk to their neighbors about things. Do these issues also play out in those contexts too? Absolutely, and uh, they, they play out when it comes to things like book displays. You know, you might have a Pride Month book display huh. or a book display about racial issues and it, books that in a very straightforward, provocative way talk about those issues. Uh, so it affects us there as well, uh, but it also affects just how libraries are serving incredibly diverse communities and making certain that our programming, our exhibitions, our staff are all, you know, reflecting reflecting those those communities. And public libraries are, I think, more dynamic than ever. They're more relevant than ever. Uh, we are all about lifelong learning, meeting people where they are, um, helping to improve lives. We have an enormous digital presence. This issue applies to ebooks and e-content as well. Uh, and something to be very mindful of there, but the libraries have addressed, uh, libraries have addressed digital equity. Uh, so many people during the pandemic uh, discovered that public libraries circulate eBooks and films online, um, and students make use of that library. We offer online courses, so yes, um, that, that point of view that says ban that book could also say, we don't want you offering that course. We don't want you having a story time that has that theme. So Nadine, what do you think that concerned not just librarians, but schools, uh, school boards, uh, and you know, all of us can, can do or should do ourselves about this? And, and actually, you can go even further than that. It's, there are probably pressures on publishers and bookstores, oh, too. We haven't even talked about that. Yeah. But what, of all these constellation of issues, what can we all do about it? Well, we have to exercise our own free speech rights to speak up affirmatively for the values of equality and, and access of ideas and people because surveys continue to indicate that it's only small minorities at either end of the ideological spectrum that are driving the demands for censorship. 
uh, either in curricula or in libraries. Uh, and unfortunately, the rest in the middle are disturbed by these trends, but not doing enough to counter them by not being outspoken enough. Um, I, the silver lining to the cloud of the publicity of, uh, toward the book banning is that it's now led to uh, growing movements against book banning. And I think most excitingly are people who will testify to the significant difference that public libraries have made in their lives. I read about one instance of Pennsylvania, by the way, is number two after Texas in terms of book banning. That surprises people who think that, well, you know, it's in that part of the country that's not so censorious. But uh, many years ago, somebody said, no, you don't understand. Pennsylvania has two large cities, uh, one in the east and one on the west, with Alabama running through the middle. Um, but anyway, one, one effort at, at book censorship, at book banning, that was thwarted in Pennsylvania was uh, thanks to powerful testimony by a young trans high school student, very courageous, because the books that were being banned were uh, very heavily uh, from the queer community, by and about that community. And he spoke so compellingly about uh, how his life literally had been saved as a result of reading certain books, that he would have been committing suicide had it not been for that. And that reminded me that, you know, when the um, internet was new and Congress greeted it, as it's all new media, including the printing press, have been greeted with efforts at censorship in the name of protecting children that's invoked over and over and over again. Uh, when the ACLU and the American Library Association successfully challenged that law, a conservative Republican judge uh, in Philadelphia said, you know, it's intended to be for the benefit of children, but it's actually not because it's depriving them of vital information about their health, about sexually transmitted diseases, about gender identity, and without those resources, they may you know, suffer lifelong adverse consequences. So I think we have to make that message that it's not only about free speech and democracy, important as those principles are, but really about life and health and other every concrete positive value in our society. John, John, what kind of advice would, would you give for people who are concerned about these issues to get, to do things, to get more involved, to make jobs like for virtuous librarians like you easier, and particularly maybe in some of the smaller towns? Sure. Know that it happens and can happen absolutely everywhere. Uh, the American Library Association's Office of Intellectual Freedom is a great place to go to see those lists, to see exactly what the top 10 books that are challenged and banned uh, each year are, and there's a new initiative of the American Library Association called United Against Book Banning that has, is a great website with very current information about this I issue currently. Uh, but continue supporting libraries, continue supporting free speech. Um, uh, libraries are just an incredibly important institution. All of you have a library story. Tell that story and share it. So, uh, as I said, we're going to turn it to the audience uh, for questions. It's hard for me to see, but I do see a hand back there. Please wait for the microphone, because as I said, we, we do tape all of these. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Abby Haug, and I'll start by sharing that one of the first gifts I remember receiving, it was a bracelet from my mom with the covers of most commonly banned books. So I really appreciate this conversation. And while you were talking, I couldn't help thinking about book talk and bookstagram and book conversations happening on Reddit and Facebook and Twitter. And I'm curious if you have seen any differences in the conversations around book banning because of the rise of social media and people connecting about books and reading using those platforms. Well, I think certainly there's a lot uh, on social media about book banning and stories about book banning as well. I know that that libraries and allied institutions are uh, talking about it, are, you know, every year public libraries celebrate Banned Books Week. Uh, it really should be Banned Books Month or maybe season, but um, <laughs> celebrating it where we're, we're talking about banned books, we're putting those books out there, having book discussion groups, book clubs, book talks, uh, bringing in authors to talk about that. So 
trying to, to create visibility and conversation about the issue. One, to me, one of the most exciting initiatives are um, high school and middle school students themselves forming, and through using social media as organizing tools, among other, forming clubs specifically to discuss banned books. So getting to a point that John alluded to, you know, somewhat perversely, these books, rather than being suppressed as the opponents hope, often gain much more attention and, and readership as a result of the efforts to ban them. So flipping that around. And I've thought that, you know, on, the theory, on, on this theme of do people who call for banning, are they even really aware of the entire book. Maybe there could be some way that we could preemptively have discussion clubs with parents who might be very concerned about what they read about some of the books. I also think that when, um, when books around particular topics are challenged and then sales go up and there's greater conversation about it, it also sends a message to the publishing world that people want books about these topics, which I think is a very good and healthy thing and much needed in the world generally, much needed in publishing, and something very welcome to libraries because, as I said, we're, we're seeking to have collections that represent everyone. Just a quick in interlude on that because I'd mentioned earlier about pressures on publishers perhaps. Have there been oh, yeah. examples of publishers actually stopping production of a book because of these kinds of pressures? Absolutely. I mean, you may know more examples than come to the top of my mind, but um, uh, um, here's a, a category we haven't talked about yet. Politically controversial figures or uh, culturally controversial figures. So Woody Allen's book was removed by his, whoever was supposed to publish it. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the publisher. Uh, Josh Hawley had his contract, I believe that was with Simon & Schuster, uh, withdrawn. Some, and, and a lot of those pressures come from within the publishing industry itself. Uh, younger staff members who have a more progressive ideology don't subscribe to this notion. And publishers, by the way, don't have anything equivalent to the Library Bill of Rights, to the best of my knowledge. They are commercial enterprises, by and large. Um, they're the, the publishing company, major publisher, uh, that has published Mein Kampf for many years has been under severe pressure from its employees not to uh, continue publishing it. There was a petition that circulated uh, in the publishing community shortly after January 6th last year. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of people who work there saying we should not publish any books by anybody or about anybody associated with the Trump administration. Question right here. And then we'll go back there. Hello, uh, my name is Tam from Wyoming and live in a school district that is in the process of, well, we have a contingent that is trying to ban books. And so this will be in a school setting, not a public library setting. But I'm hoping you can chat a little bit with, to me, the absurdity of banning books, right, versus cell phones in school systems where <laughs> there's so much more access, but it seems like it's the physical book that is so offended versus the internet. Th that's such an interesting point. If I may say, when you mention Wyoming, I know Wyoming is a state where there have been efforts to prosecute librarians, uh, I believe on obscenity charges for, and the prosecutors have looked into the charges, but so far have not pursued them. And by the way, librarians are, are under severe psychological stress, so it's another reason for us to give them support. But I, I, I think that's such an interesting point because there are so many alternative ways of getting access to um, uh, controversial ideas. There must be something symbolic about a book, both positive and negative. I think that's exactly what it is. You know, you, you think about when that window opens to the digital universe, the, all the content that is there to access and compared it to the comparing it to just the content within a single book, be it an ebook or a or a physical book, uh, that is quite a contrast, but I think it is sort of the symbolic idea of removing that idea. I'll also say that in school li school libraries have just been diminished severely across the country. School librarians are doing all sorts of things within school districts and resources are diminished and school libraries um, suffer because of that and the amount of digital content um, available to students is diminished as well. 
uh, public libraries are the school libraries uh, today. So it, that's another reason why it's so important to make certain that we have that content. I, 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 your excellent question, and I'm gonna continue to reflect on it, thank, so thank you for putting that bug in my head. But of course made me think of Ray Bradbury's uh, famous book, Fahrenheit 451, which I recently reread uh, for the first time in a long time. And what I had forgotten was that the pressure to burn the books in that dystopia came not from the top, not from government officials, but it came from the grassroots up. People who were rebelling against the dangerous ideas and antisocial ideas were in turn demanding that government officials and law enforcement destroy books. So that's very sobering concern about our culture as, as you raised, Elliot. And I have to say one of the dearest friends of the Los Angeles Public Library was Ray Bradbury. Ray Bradbury would do a program in a branch library for 12 people, sign books and spend all afternoon talking to them. Wow. Dear, dear person. Okay, right here and then a gentleman over by the window. Please. Uh, hi. Um, as we gradually move away from physical books and more toward digital books that you can download on your iPad, is that going to make it harder to censor books? Is that going to make it harder to ban books and keep books away from people who want to access that information? I don't, I don't think so. I think the issue is absolutely still there. Uh, public libraries, we in LA Public Library spend millions of dollars a year on e-books and e-content. Mm -hmm. it, it operates, surprisingly to many people, in the exact same way uh, as we acquire physical books. So for a bestseller, we might acquire 200, 500 copies of it, um, and we circulate those books, and when you know they're all out and someone comes along and wants one, they go on a waiting list, and it disappears off your device when it's due, so it, it, it operates in much the same way. So I think the, the desire to keep it from the populace uh, would still be there, um, even in an e-book. So it's not, when a public library has an e-book, it's not like we can check it out to you and then you can allow your 25 friends to have it. It's encrypted so that it operates very similarly to a, an e-book. So I think the issue is still there with digital content. And over here, which we have two minutes, it may be the last question, but please. Uh, hi, my name is Glenn Sonnenberg. I'm from Los Angeles. I'm on the board of a university library. My question is that it feels that, that um, voices of reason are constantly on the defense and not the offense. So my question is, what would it, w there used to be things called like public service announcements on TV. Can the library community establish a book of like a, a list of these are the books this year that we recommend and this is why we recommend them. Like, Huck Finn is not, Huck Finn is about Jim and Huck. And these are ideals that we should be encouraging people. And they're like books of the year. These are 10 books we want everyone to read. Does such a thing exist and should it? Well, public librarians and librarians generally sit around and have lots of conversations about public <laughs> promotional campaigns. There are many things that we want to say <laughs> and talk about and let the broader community know about. Libraries and certainly, you know, most public libraries have a very strong social media presence, and and they're certainly putting out recommended lists and things things just like that. So, uh, I think that's a great idea. Speaking of Huckleberry Finn, one of the the great defenders of Huckleberry Finn and the idea of it being banned being a horrible idea was Toni Morrison, another mm -hmm. author, African American author, who also had books on a banned books list. So, we have a last question. Yes, the gentleman right here. Okay, but you just wait for the microphone. Hi, thank you for the interesting conversation. I was wondering, are there any books that you think should be off the library shelves because of objectionable material at all? Not ob objectionable, if I can imagine books that don't have sufficient literary, artistic, political, or scientific value to warrant taking um, uh, uh, some of the limited finite resources to purchase them in the first place right. or to house them in the second place. So those are content decisions but would never be based on the fact that I object either morally or politically to the viewpoint. Well said, and, and librarians are making those decisions all the time in terms of what to add to to both physical print collections as well as um, digital collections as well. Well, 
I'd like you all to join me in thanking our two wonderful Thank